Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. My name is Robbie and I'm going to be taking you on this strange adventure as we change things up this episode. Normally I would build a model, talk about the model, and we'd go off on our further YouTube adventures. However, this time around I'm also building a diorama and my first figure. Once again, with this kit, Hasegawa shows that they understand what the term budget and quality mean and don't really cut any corners. Unlike some other brands that I won't mention, Hasegawa brings this kit in is a very reasonable price. You can pick it up for under $40 Canadian and you get a lot of great detail, great fit, and a great looking model in the end that you haven't had to struggle to put together. With this kit, I chose to add some more detail in the cockpit and other than the wiring I put on the floor, it's a pretty tight pit, so you're not really going to see anything on the sidewalls, so I kind of wasted my time. However, it doesn't hurt to practice those skills like adding cabling and stuff like that, because the next thing you know, you may be doing an aircraft that lets you see that. In this kit, Hasegawa gives you the options of doing the aluminum American test aircraft after it had been captured, or you can do it in the Japanese Navy colors. And I wanted to do something in the middle ground, and I knew I also wanted to make it a little more interesting with a diorama. I do have to give a shout out to the Small Subjects podcast because they have some great guests on there that talk about painting figures and putting together dioramas. There's a lot of pitfalls you can drop into as a noob and it's not just something you throw together. There's a lot of planning in it and a lot of their guests have gone into their process and there's a lot more to it than I thought there would be. But I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a few minutes. First, I want to cover some more information about the George and why it was an important aircraft. As I stated in a previous video when building the Zero, that aircraft fell off pretty quick as new American aircraft came into service. And it wasn't until the George came along that the Japanese Navy had an aircraft that was equivalent to its counterparts like the Corsair, Mustang, and Hellcat. It could match them in turns, it was just as fast, and it had a lot of firepower. The only thing going against the Japanese was they didn't have a lot of skilled pilots and they didn't make enough of the aircraft to make a big difference. That doesn't mean the George wasn't dangerous though. In one encounter, they managed to shoot down three Corsairs and damage another five with no losses on their side. Out of the five Corsairs that returned, three were so badly damaged they would never fly again. One other change of Japanese aircraft design was that the George was a very rugged aircraft and could take a lot of damage compared to its predecessor, the Zero. Today, only three of the aircraft remain, three in the United States and one in Japan. Let's talk a little bit about seam cleanup on a model. If there's one thing I hate, it's when I've put a model together, it's in primer, I start putting down some paint, and then I notice there's a ghost seam. And a ghost seam is exactly what it sounds like. It's a seam that just barely shows up, or it might only show up from a certain angles. So, how do you avoid this? With this build, I decided to try things a little bit differently. Instead of using my Mr. Cement S, the really quick acting glue, I decided to slow it down a little bit and use Tamiya's white cap. And what that does is it takes longer to melt the parts together and gives you a much firmer join. And then if you squeeze it a little bit, it pushes out a little bit of styrene. I then let the model dry for a full 24 hours overnight and then come in the next day to do some sanding. And I'll start with usually a 400 grit sanding block and work my way all the way up to 4000. I don't skip any of the stages as this gives me a nice smoother finish and cuts down on the scratches you have to clean up. Now let's say you do all that and you get a few spots that still have a seam line. What I'll do in that case is just put down some sprue goo, let that melt into the plastic which is nice because putties and super glue just sit on top of the plastic and then after a few hours you can come back in and sand that. Once all that body work is done, I then come in with my razor saw or an airbrush needle and replace the details that got nuked. Hasegawa gives you a really nice detailed engine for this kit and the only thing I did to improve it was to add some spark plug wires. Now I kind of cheated and drilled holes into the crankcase cover and you're not going to see this because the spinner on this aircraft is quite large and what this is going to do is allow me to neatly run two wires to each cylinder. I like to use lead wire for this because it's very soft and easy to bend and then I'll secure it with super glue. Before drilling any holes in the plastic I'll normally use an airbrush needle or a center punch just to mark the dead center of that hole and that gives the drill bit something to sit in before cutting and make sure that it doesn't wander all over the place. 
In my experience, I've also found the best way to keep PCB drill bits from snapping off or coming up into your face is to let the drill bit do the work. Don't try to push that or jam that into the plastic as you're putting more stress on it. Just set it there and let it slowly chew its way through. Just because this kit is a cheaper kit doesn't mean it has to look cheap. And one way to improve the look of it, as always, is to come in with a riveting tool and start laying out some rivet lines. I have a tutorial here above that'll show you how to do that. By firmly pressing the riveting tool into the plastic, it leaves a nice round imprint. The only problem is, is that pushes up the plastic in the surrounding area. So after you've marked out all your rivets and have it ready for the next stage, you have to come in with some sandpaper or sanding sticks to knock those divots down and just make sure everything is nice and flush. Or else it won't look right when you put paint down. Out of all the aircraft models I've done, this was the hardest one to find the proper blueprint for, and it actually took a few nights before I found it. That's why there was a jump in the video here, because at one point I thought I was only be able to do the panels and would have to kind of guesstimate. With all the bodywork complete, it was now time to move on to paint, and the first thing I'll do is paint the canopy in the internal color of the cockpit, and what this does, it gives you a fake impression that the cockpit interior frame is painted when in fact it's not. Once the colors were down on the cockpit and the leading edges, I then painted the entire model Mr. Metal Color aluminum, and my plan was to mask the bottom with AK masking putty. But the problem with that putty is if you put it on a metallic paint like this, it does a little bit of damage as you pull it off. So just be aware before you do that, you might wanna seal it in a clear. After the aluminum paint had a full 24 hours to dry, I then covered the model in three thin, keyword thin coats of chipping fluid. And it's important to note that if it, this beads up at any point when spraying it on, you've put it on too thick. I find by misting it on in a very thin coat so you just see almost fibers going down, that's the best way to do it. Do it in a few thin coats and then come in with your color. If it's too thick, it's just gonna peel off in sheets and not look right. One problem that presents itself when you're doing these Japanese colors on top of aluminum is it's hard to get rid of that aluminum shining through. So to start off all the sandwich shading, I use some NATO black. The reason for that, it's a very dark color, but it's still easy to build off of with the sandwich shading. And what that means is I just come in with some lighter tones of greens and grays and browns, just to make that paint have some more depth to it. And this is the first weathering stage as well. One thing I noticed with the AK black green was that it didn't cover very well as a blend coat. And even after several blend layers, the colors underneath were still really strong and not letting that green do its thing. So I actually had to do quite a lot of post shading just to tie everything together or else it would have looked really weird with a dark, dark olive drab color and then this bright green. In hindsight, if I was to do this color again, I would use more yellows and blues underneath just to kind of stay with that final greens tone. Now that all the painting had been done, it was time to come in and start the chipping. And I was gonna be very aggressive with it to match the photo. The first step for chipping is to lay down some water just to reactivate the chipping fluid underneath the paint. And I like to use the sanding sponge to first break down the paint because this helps the water get underneath in a few more spots and it gives you some random chips to start building off of. Once I'm done with the sponge, I'll come in with a brush or a toothpick or even a needle to start refining everything. All of those tools are gonna to give you different shaped chips to work with. Because paint was put right on top of metal on these aircraft, there are a lot of examples out there of some really beat up ones. And just like any time you're doing weathering, try to have some references on hand because you wanna stay within the realm of what makes sense and what tells a story. You're not gonna just do chipping in one area if it doesn't make sense. So make sure you get some good references on hand before doing any of this. Now I didn't spend the same amount of time night shifted chipping his tiger, but I did spend a few nights doing this. And the reason for that is I would do it in stages. I would spend about an hour chipping the model and then I would walk away from it and come back the next night with some fresh eyes to see if I liked it if I liked the story it was telling, and to see if I needed to keep doing it, or if I was happy with it. And on the last night, I got to a point where I felt like it very closely matched the references, and I didn't want to push it any further. I had a feeling that if you were to keep doing this for a few hours, you would start to zone out, and the next thing you realize, you've chipped off all the paint on the model, 
and you pretty much have to start again. To get the larger areas of chipped paint, I would use a toothpick because the wood was soft enough it would not damage the aluminum paint underneath, but it would allow me to pick off the acrylic paint quite easily. And it would start with small chips and I could gradually build up to bigger chips to starting to tear off chunks of the paint. I found this was the easiest method to get chips and areas to match the references. Although that final brighter green didn't exactly match with the colors it was on top of, it actually worked out quite well in making the paint look very dynamic. And for the first time I feel on this channel, the next shot here is really going to show that. If you look at the tail and then the colors on there, you're going to notice there's a lot going on that actually works well together. Some light green, a dark green, the touch up, and then even where my thumb had started to polish the rudder a little bit and allow the aluminum paint to shine back through. That right there is what the whole idea of sandwich shading is. For the tail number on the aircraft, Woody put together a stencil in Fusion and then sent that over to me as a file to cut on my silhouette machine. Just as a heads up though, if you're masking on top of chipping fluid, you want to really detack your vinyl or else you run the risk of tearing up your paint in sheets. Even something as soft as washi tape, you're really going to want to detack as well. And here are some of the references I used for the chipping of this aircraft. The nice thing about having the American pilot in that aircraft is it means it's the exact time frame that I wanted to do this aircraft and diorama at. For one last layer of chipping, I used the sponge chipping method and this just leaves some very, very tiny microchips in your paint and does a great job of tying everything together. Simply dab the sponge in some paint Unload as much as you can till it's almost leaving nothing behind, and then use that for your chipping. As drastic as that sandwich shading looks paint-wise, as soon as you hit it with a pin wash, it tends to push it back quite a bit. So when weathering an aircraft model, you have to keep in mind how all of these layers are going to add up in the end and interact with each other. Because you might spend a lot of time in one area, and then have it completely nulled by another step further down the road. Before moving into oils, I like putting out a pin wash because that helps break the model down into smaller, more manageable areas. And instead of trying to do oils everywhere at once, you can pretty much do one panel at a time. Oils are still one of the most powerful paints you can use on a model. By using different thicknesses, thinning it down, and using different brushes, you can really play with what's going on in the paint. I felt that my markings were too bright at this stage and I used some pink oil paint and blended that in just to fade it out. Because this paint was straight from the oil tube, you'll notice it has a very drastic effect and takes quite a bit of work to blend in with the stippling brush. After the markings, I chose to bring in some brighter green just to have the paint look more sun faded. Because this oil paint was thinned down quite a bit, it takes a while to build up the effect in multiple layers. This process doesn't have to take a long time either because once you're happy with the layer, you come in with a hair dryer, dry the paint, and then continue onwards rather than leaving it to dry. Think of it as hitting the save button, if that makes sense. After the bright green, I then moved on to some field gray, which is a very dark colored green, and put that in areas around hinges, access hatches and things like that just to make them look like a moving working part and as the final step i use some starship filth just to make areas look even more grimy to enhance the look of the kit gun barrels i use some pcb drill bits just to hollow out the tubes and to make it look more accurate so other than the seat belts this kit straight from the box Here's where I take a giant step outside of my comfort zone and try something new, and that's doing a miniature figure. And I decided to take Night Shift's approach and just do some pre-shading and come in some very thin acrylic paint layers to build up the color and maintain the shadows and highlights. The biggest challenge I found was painting the face and the skin colors of the miniature. Even though I had the paints thinned down, I found that they weren't building up properly and I really had to play with how much thinner and retarder I was using. I ended up having to strip this figure twice before I was happy with the skin. The biggest tip I can give anybody who's starting miniatures is to make sure you get some quality ones. If they have some great sculpting, it allows you to really see where you can put your highlights and shadows to make that figure come to life. 
don't waste your time with some figures that suck because it's going to be an even bigger challenge than it needs to be. For the first two attempts painting the miniature's face, I used AK's flesh set and I found that the colors didn't consistently blend and then I changed over to Vallejo. I found that it blended a lot more consistently and it was easier to control. I made sure I referenced two really good channels when doing this figure. The first one is Small Soldier by Scott, who's actually kind of local to me, and the second one was Shane Smith. Both of those guys do some great work primarily in figures, and their tutorials really helped me out, so be sure to check them out. Two other things that were really great references were two podcasts I enjoy listening to. The first one that focuses a lot on miniature painters is Small Subjects, and the second one is the Sprue Cutters Union. Both of them have had some fantastic guests who really get into their process of miniatures and how they put a plan to do dioramas, and they're definitely worth a listen. One of the key things that really stood out is that when you're painting a miniature to go with your model, is that it should receive just as much effort and enthusiasm as the model did, because you want this to enhance the entire scene and not just be something you plopped down. This figure is from ICM's USAAF Grand Crew set, and it couldn't be more perfect for what I had in mind. The idea I had in my head was what would it be like for the crews at the end of the war seeing these Japanese aircraft up close for the first time and in person. At first I had all the figures from the set put together and sitting around the aircraft unpainted, and it just seemed too busy at the time and wasn't really what I had in mind. No matter how I posed them, there was too much going on, or they didn't seem to be interacting with each other. And that's one of the key things with the diorama from what I've learned. Now with the figure painted, it was time to move on to the base. And this was another first because I've not really done a diorama before. So I needed a way to change this wooden plank into something a little more dynamic. I ordered a pack of Dawes clay from Amazon for 20 bucks, and by wetting the wood, it really helps the clay stick to it. And I started building a little field. I was careful to leave one side of the plank flat though, as I planned on putting down some concrete slabs to simulate an airfield. To make the concrete slabs, I used my silhouette cutter and some very thin clear styrene, because that's all I had on hand, and made some three by three centimeter squares and cut them out. And then I glued these down onto the wood as tightly as I could to simulate the parking apron of an airfield. It didn't matter if these did not line up 100% because if you ever look at concrete slabs over time, they start to move away from each other and then you start getting grass coming up through them. I was gonna do one half of this diorama as the concrete, but it looked more interesting to cut it off and have the aircraft sitting off center and have everything asymmetric. For some reason, having everything equal and sharp and square to each other just didn't look natural to my eye. To generate some discussion in the comments below, why don't you tell me some challenges you've had with doing dioramas? What are some things you enjoyed? What are some things that you wish you knew before starting out? Post them below and I'll reply to as many as I can. It's always fun to talk to you guys and engage with you and just keep the banter going. After letting everything dry overnight, the next day I covered the diorama with some Mod Podge again and then laid down some garden dirt just to build up the ground and to add some texture in the areas that would later see some grass. I made sure to put an old cardboard box lid underneath the diorama during this stage. That way I could drain off all the dirt and put it back in the container for next time. Not that there's any shortage of dirt here in Alberta. We haven't seen any rain now for about three weeks. After I was happy with the coverage of the dirt, I then applied a thin layer of Mod Podge to lock everything down. Then after it dried for another 24 hours, I took it out to the garage and applied two thin coats of Sur Mr. Surfacer 1200 from a spray can. After that, it was time to start bringing in some color. Just like the model, I brought in some sandwich shading just to make the concrete look more interesting. I could have just sprayed it all gray, but that would have been boring. Instead, I used Tamiya Rubber Black, some earth colors, some khaki, some light gray and dark gray, and just kept building up the layers until I was happy with how the concrete looked. 
I used desert yellow for the base color of the dirt because it seemed to more closely match the colors in the reference photos I was using. I did come in with a little bit of buff afterwards to lighten it and to add some highlights, but this was all going to get buried under a layer of static grass. Once the ground was painted, I came in with the Mod Podge again, this time thinned with some water, that way it would conduct a little bit of electricity, and then brought in a static grass applicator to apply some grass. The only problem is it's hard to film this when it's this close to the camera. After the grass was down on the diorama, I then brought in some oils again just to highlight the cracks between the concrete, to do some oil spills, and to do some fuel spills. And those chalks on the ground there, they're actually made with wire, painted white to look like rope. To make the diorama a little more interesting and to put some more eye candy on it, I decided to make a sign using the kit's decals for the captured George, just to show that the aircraft was under new management. To do that, I just cut myself a piece of styrene to about the size of what the decal was to simulate a board, and then I made a post for it. I then had the idea of using a 148 Tamiya stowage set and trying to make a Japanese flag from one of the tarps. I painted it off white and then used one of the decals for the roundels. I had to lift the bottom of the tarps up though in order to wrap the decal underneath and then I used some Tamiya Mark Fit Super Strong to melt it down and that actually worked really well with the Hasegawa decals and made it look painted on. To avoid having the decal wrap underneath and stick to the tape that the piece was on, I used a toothpick to prop it up. I grabbed three fuel drums out of that stowage set as well, painted them in some Japanese color and chipped it off to a German gray underneath and then added in a rust wash. And with that, the diorama was pretty much complete. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons for their financial support of this channel. 132 scale supporters get to see the videos a week early ad free and 148 supporters get to see them 24 hours early ad free. I'm also available for messaging, put up blog posts, and have been hanging out with one of the guys on Saturday nights as we both build an F-104 together, and it's been a great time. You also don't have to join Patreon to support the channel, simply click subscribe and hit the bell icon below so you get notified when I put up new content. And as always, like the video, comment below, and if you don't like it, let me know why. I'm always open to feedback and it helps me bring you better content. I am Robbie, I'm pretending to be the model guy, and I will see you next time.